The former leader of the SNP, Gordon Wilson, has warned the party to put its own house in order before going for a second referendum. He fears that with the Indy Ref 2 draft bill published, there will be those in the party who push for a referendum too soon. Earlier, I spoke to Mr Wilson. His message was, don't push for independence right now. Uh, the reason against having one is that uh, Scotland, uh, that is independence, is unlikely to win uh, because there is a gap of, between, uh, of 10 points between 45 and 55 and quite narrow territory in which to fight it. But, of course, uh, if there's enough provocation from London, as seems to be the case with uh, Theresa May and her ministers being very harsh in their terms about the consultation of Scotland. Who can tell what the result will be? If you go back to the first referendum, uh, then, of course, there was a huge gap to begin with, and um, it started moving in favour of independence when George Osborne, the Chancellor of the Exchequer, uh, started threatening Scotland that they couldn't use the British pound. But for now, you think it shouldn't be a priority? Well, my, my preference is that uh, over a longer time span we concentrate on the narrative of independence, why Scotland should have it, what the economic advantages would be, what weaknesses we required to resolve in our society, and, um, in other words, to do the basic homework. People will want to know. They want to touch the solution and see if it... Uh, is solid enough for them to rely on. Uh, of course, beyond that, there's a question of identity, but that tends to fall into place automatically anyway. And there are dangers, aren't there? In, in a, an interview we did on, on the radio earlier, you, you, you said that a second referendum at the moment could be a waste of time, but it, it's a bit more than that, isn't it? If they lost a second referendum, it's worse than a waste of time. It's, it could be counterproductive. Uh, it, well, it was me being delicately uh, diplomatic about it. But yes, of course, uh, Theresa May faces the same problem. If she pushes the hard, strident line that London is doing at the moment, then uh, quite obviously they could drive Scottish public opinion towards independence. Uh, it's, uh, it's a bit of a gamble for both sides. But your golden rule, isn't it, is that you don't have an independence referendum unless you know you can win it. That's my preference in, uh, in business, in life, in anything. It's far better to be in a strong position, having laid down uh, the conditions under which it will take place. And I think uh, in the current a rather difficult situation of Brexit, uh, then it's going to be a very complicated question to answer, and I'm not sure it can easily be done in the course of a, a six-month referendum campaign. Having said that, of course... One of the things we've got to note is the access to the single market. And uh, Nicola Sturgeon is pushing the independence line as a means of kicking the uh, British government into looking at Scotland's needs. Uh, Scotland will suffer pretty badly uh, if the Brexit deal does not look at our particular needs as uh, an economy and as a society. So she's quite right. Unfortunately, the Scottish people don't show the same enthusiasm if their polls are to be believed, because if they showed support for independence or for another referendum, then I think you would find that London's views would change very sharply. You think, before you have a referendum, what, 55 60% in favour in the polls? Is that the sort of thing that you have in mind? Well, my, yes, my, my figure is something like 55 to 60 is, is safer territory. But, of course, I'm, you know, like most former politicians, are fairly opportunistic about these matters, and things can change rather radically. Uh, but at the moment, I think the um, consensus view is uh, that you would need a little bit of a buffer. Don't forget... Uh, we're living in uh, tremulous times with the UK pulling out of the European Union. That is both a plus and a minus factor. And there are, the Scottish economy has declined in the last couple of years because of the drop down in oil revenues and oil activity affecting jobs. So it's not the best of times. But on the other hand, wherever there are challenges, there are opportunities. So one must keep one's mind open. You would like a longer-term campaign for independence, not a referendum necessarily, put that to one side, but for independence, and for that campaign to be separated out from the SNP government, wouldn't you? I think the thing that the SNP has got to keep in mind is that uh, the outcome of a referendum may be a vote on its popularity. The success of the 
uh, 2014 independence referendum was a way in which it uh, brought together all sorts of people out of uh, out of the dark, so to speak, into the political arena with new enthusiasms. They still exist, though I suspect a lot of the fizz has gone out of the bottle since. And uh, one has to get them together to give them the arguments why Scotland needs independence so that they can speak to their friends and neighbours and family. Uh, also, that um, the work has to be done. And I'd, my experience as a Member of Parliament for 13 years was I had the naive view of being elected that I had plenty of time to think. In actual fact, I was on a treadmill and had no time to think, and that's particularly true of those who are in government. So I would think it would be better if uh, the running of the campaign, the development, the research were subcontracted by the SNP fairly independently to some other body which would have the time uh, and the uh, priority uh, to give to the, uh, uh, the question of independence itself. I think I should stress this, that a referendum is only a means to an end. It's not an end in itself. The end must be independence from the point of view of the nationalist community. And um, we've got to prepare the ground so that uh, people are persuaded that the best possible thing for Scotland in the long run, in middle term, is to obtain independence. Now, you would presumably, well, in fact, almost by definition, that would involve bringing in other people outside the SNP. One of the reasons I'm asking you this is uh, I'll be talking later in this programme to Patrick Harvey, the leader of the Scottish Greens, and I, th I, I don't know what he'll say, but I know there is a feeling among some who are in favour of independence but who are not in the SNP that they're being a bit patronised or patronised and, and they're being a bit left out. Uh, now, you might have a, your idea might be a solution to that. Uh, yes, I mean, don't forget, of course, I was uh, an SNP functionary as a national secretary in, inform, in, in favour of discipline and so forth within the party. But I've relaxed with the years. And uh, there, there is an example. In the early uh, uh, 70s, there was a body called Radio Free Scotland, which uh, was separate from the SNP, but uh, worked alongside it and produced the message. I would think that we don't need two separate bodies, but we do need the SNP governing Scotland and uh, giving a good impression there. And also another body which concentrates on uh, the movement and uh, the economic and social case for independence. That's where we need to take the voices from other people, including people like Patrick Harvey and the Greens, including uh, many others in the various organisations which... Uh, uh, mushroom during the first referendum. They're still there, but they should be consulted and it would be a, a strength that that should be. You've got to be careful about that because uh, too much uh, uh, independence from that point of view can uh, cause anarchy. So uh, uh, there has to be some guidance, but um, the SNP should not be heavy-handed. You said in the radio interview we did that was broadcast earlier today that there was homework still to be done, and we talked a little bit about the deficit that Scotland might have should it become independent. I, I should apologise. I said it was 15% uh, of GDP. In fact, it's 15 billion pounds. It's, it's just under 10% of GDP, but nevertheless a very big number. And we talked a little bit about how perhaps the Scottish government could head off those objections if it tried to have a more balanced budget. Now, I know one of your points is that you think the jazz figures don't reflect the real state of the Scottish economy, but you spoke in that interview about maybe the civil service could be cut back. But that's a tiny amount of money, isn't it? The, the, the civil service is... Well, is... So the, the, the civil service consumes quite a bit of uh, money in itself, of course, but uh, the main problem I had with the civil service is, from experience and looking at it uh, latterly, is it's not all that efficient. And I would say that uh, an efficiency drive within the civil service itself, including a drop in numbers, uh, would be desirable whether or not you head for independence. It's also a bad thing to exist uh, solely on the bottom. Yeah, the, the, the uh, point I services. was making. The, the point I was making was that that it may or may not be a good thing to have more efficiency in the civil service, but it doesn't actually address the deficit problem because civil service spending is such a, no, a small proportion of public spending. 
Well, what people don't uh, realise is that when you take the JERS figures, that's the estimate of the Scotland's budget, is based upon the fact that a lot of the inputs, that is the money which uh, uh, is allocated to Scotland, is not spent in Scotland. Foreign service, defence, uh, social security, some of it, of course, is spent in Scotland. But um, there are things that are excluded. What we don't have at the moment is a Scottish budget. And I think that Scotland should refashion its uh, uh, budget to suit the realities of an independent Scotland. OK. And we're not a cut-down part of the United okay. Kingdom, after all. Can I just... One more thing I wanted to ask you about briefly is, is that one point you made earlier was you said that uh, we were talking about how support for independence started at 27% at the beginning of the independence uh, referendum campaign. And one of your points was, well, why was it only 27% after seven years of SNP government. What's your answer to that question well, reason, that you raised? Well, the reason, is, the reason is fairly simple. The SNP had been preparing for government over a period of years, and, in fact, its way of looking at uh, independence was uh, that it became the Scottish Referendum Party and then, surprisingly, found itself in ability, uh, with an ability to deliver, which it hadn't expected. In other words, during that period... Uh, virtually no resources had gone in to the question of uh, independence and too much money had gone into the question of uh, government. Fine for government if that's your objective. If your uh, other objective is independence, then resources should be so put into that. So they didn't make the case. And that's exactly the point. They didn't no, make well, the case. No, well, yes, and that's exactly the point I'm making for the future, is that there should be a longer-term establishment and projection of the case for independence so we don't make the mistake of the 27% as in 2014. Gordon Wilson, thank you very much indeed.